Hi, and welcome to Whitetail Edge. I'm Ben Rising, and this episode of Whitetail Edge is really a special episode. Um, we're introducing a new fella. He's been a friend of mine for some time, and his name is Mike Lake. And uh, Mike is a policeman in Newark, Ohio. Um, but Mike has got a really incredible story that he is going to bring out in this episode. And I don't think there's any person alive that doesn't remember 911. Um, and that doesn't remember where they were at the exact moment that that happened. Uh, I remember it like it's yesterday. It's etched in my mind for, forever. Um, I was sitting in a little cafe uh, down in southern Ohio. I was looking at timber, and we'd stop to eat some lunch, and it come across the news. Um, and I'll just never forget it. Um, it was just, and, you know, I instantly called home to my wife, and, you know, I was two and a half hours away from home. and But, yeah, you just don't forget those things. But that turn of events led to so many different things that I think a lot of us don't realize, you know, what people went through and what the military ended up, you know, doing for us. And Mike just happened to be at that stage of his life, young guy, graduated in 99, enlisted in the Marines. 911 hits and he's going overseas. Um, but this story is really unique because Mike and his guys, you know, they they actually filmed a lot of this. So you're going to see real footage here. And I want to encourage you to just hang with this hunt because we'll get to the hunt, but this is a really big story. And, you know, Mike is really wanting to honor the guys in his battalion that he lost. And he lost a lot of people. Um, and I don't think this war really got the attention as far as how many American lives were lost. Um, you know, you hear a lot about Nam, World War One and Two, things like that, but I just don't think we understand how many boys lost their lives. And this is a really touching story to me. Um, and I can tell you, I'm glad to know Mike, you know, and there's two other guys on our team that also, you know, were in the military, Matt Davis and Jeff Klump. And, you know, I don't know their stories as deep as I do Mike's now, but I would have never guessed Mike went through what he did because the normalcy that he's somehow able to display in his life is just mind blowing to me after what he experienced and what he saw. Um, he's just one of the nicest, calmest people I've ever met in my life. And, you know, I just really thankful that he's been able to move on, but what he saw and what you're going to see in this video and the really cool thing is, is like how bow hunting has helped him in his life, how it's helped him heal, how it helps him uh, navigate this stuff. You know, obviously God gives us, you know, different things. And, you know, Mike is able to resonate with the bow hunting and the hunting and getting in the woods and nature and, and how this has helped him. And, you know, a lot of our military guys, you know, I think they hunt and, it's a, it's a healing process for them. And, you know, but it's just really sad for me because when I watch this video and I watch what Mike has gone through and all the boys and the, and the families that lost loved ones during any war that's ever happened in this country or for this country, um, and to see what our country is going through right now, the people that are basically spitting on the flag, their morals are out the window. And they do not care. They have no idea what people sacrifice for them to be the idiots that they're being right now. And to not appreciate the freedoms they have. And it's just mind-blowing to me. And it's sad that they don't understand it. But all I can do is pray for this country and pray for those people and hope that things get better. Um, but with all this said, I just want you to hang in this episode. We'll get to the hunt. But really listen to this story and just thank your lucky stars that if you didn't have to experience this, like I didn't, you know, um, I was old enough at the time and had a family and whatever. They didn't need us. They didn't draft whatever. I didn't have to go. My dad was in Vietnam when he was a young man. I feel like I'm lucky to even be here for what he saw over there. Uh, me and my brother, both, you know, it's like, you're, we're just lucky to be made and be here to, to be able to do what we're doing. Um, he was one of the ones that made it home. You know, so many other people didn't. 
And, you know, just don't forget that the things that we have in this country and why we have them. Um, but with that said, thank you for watching Whitetail Edge. Uh, without you guys, the fans, you know, Whitetail Edge is nothing. So um, I hope you enjoy this episode. It's a little different, but Mike really wanted to honor the group of guys that he was in, you know, the military with and the lives that were lost. So um, I hope you enjoy this episode and respect it. Whitetail Edge is brought to you by Mossy Oak. Black Widow Deer Lures, Prime Archery, G5 Outdoors, and Novix Tree Stands. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 3 of Whitetail Edge. I'm Mike Lake. So this is my first year on the Whitetail Edge team. I'm super excited to be a part of it. A little bit about myself prior to this point. I graduated high school in 1999 from a small farm school in Central Ohio. Went into the Marine Corps directly after high school and uh, prior to 9-11. Um, so it was you know, during peacetime that I was uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, what made me want to join the Marine Corps, I guess, um, always kind of wanted to do uh, be in the military, but uh, really stood out to me was uh, one of my memories of my grandmother before she passed away was uh, back in 1991 watching uh, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War on TV with her um, really made me want to join. Uh, she passed away in 95 and uh, wasn't, you know, of course able to be around to watch me uh, join the Marine Corps in 99. So. I uh, wanted to do that in her memory, and uh, so that's what I did. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. So in March of 2003, President Bush announces that, you know, we're going to invade Iraq with Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, at that time, you know, our bags are packed and we're on standby. Fall of 2004 rolls around, we get deployment orders uh, that we're gonna be shipping out to Iraq. Um, January 2005, uh, you know, we ship out to California. Um, we're gonna be doing a two month uh, workup training exercise at 29 Palms. End of that two months, so we're Pushing the end of February now, uh, we load up a plane, fly out to Kuwait. Go ahead, Coleman. First of all, we almost got hit by an anti air mine. <laughs> the same with you, fish. I hope you're enjoying taking a video of me taking a video of you. It might be difficult to see this, but this is our accommodations for the first night here. This is G minus two, which means we are two floors below ground level. It smells like, uh, I don't know, describe the smell, Lance Corbin Lake. It smells like, um, I got you were to stick your head <laughs> down inside the port of Johns. <laughs> we're in Kuwait for a couple of days. We catch another uh, uh, aircraft into Al Assad Air Base in Iraq. Uh, from Al Assad Air Base, uh, we we aboard uh, uh, CH-46 and CH-53 helicopters, and we fly to our uh, forward operating base at the Haditha Dam in Haditha, Iraq. impressions of Iraq you know so obviously uh, it's uh, still winter months um, it was uh, pretty cold over there at the in the early early stages of the deployment um, we fall in on a unit that uh, 
we were going to replace and we spent about a week week or so with that unit kind of doing a right seat left seat uh, type thing um, get acclimated to the the area of operation that we're going to be in um, that unit you know they ship out head back home after a long deployment and all of a sudden you know uh, we're the we're the guys <laughs> start out with, you know, small, kind of doing small foot patrols, just uh, some local patrols in the area, getting our vehicles ready, and uh, stuff like that. Um, first couple months, you know, we kind of encounter some, uh, you know, insurgent activity, um, small arms fire, a couple IEDs and stuff, you know, but uh, nobody really gets... Uh, uh, seriously wounded or anything uh, until you know we get into May. Um, May 8th rolls around um, Mother's Day uh, 2005 there um, we have uh, we ship up to Al Qaim Iraq right along the Syrian border we cross uh, the army builds a bridge for us to cross the Euphrates River and we get into some cities over on the other side of the river there um, Clearing cities, uh, actually a, a, an area that we didn't really anticipate any, any heavy resistance. Uh, we come across um, insurgent you know, activity. Um, they're buried in, barricaded in houses, and uh, we take our first uh, casualties of war. Fast forward three days later, um, moving through a city. Uh, we have a Amtrak uh, with full, full of Marines. Um, they come across, roll over top of a, a pressure switch uh, landmine. Um, several Marines, you know, on board, uh, wounded and, and killed in action. Um, kind of move through the spring there, uh, get into the summer months. Um, still carrying on our missions, um, clearing cities, uh, doing what you know infantry, Marines, and uh, infantry units are doing over there, um, taking weapons caches, you know, destroying, destroying those, clearing the cities, pushing out the bad guys. Our new TV and NCO lounge, motivated Sergeant Halton. Corporal to be Whiteman. Mm -hmm. Sergeant Burke here doing his crafty <laughs> handiwork, building God knows what. August, um, the, the the unit, uh, the company's on a uh, mission heading out to uh, clear some cities. Pretty big uh, movement of Marines, and we, you know we're trying to go off road. Well, we have Iraqi uh, troops with us. However, they don't have the vehicles to go off road like the Marines do, so it kind of forces us back onto the roads. Um, going into a city and my vehicle, you know, just rolled over a, a IED um, buried underneath the road. And a couple minutes later, it was just a loud explosion. 
Um, I looked back and it was just a ball of fire, you know, as far in the sky as you can see. Um, come to find out, you know, it had hit a uh, Amtrak full of Marines and uh, killed all 15 on board. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, that he will lay down his life for his friends. So I'd like to take a moment to uh, list off individually uh, each one of my brothers that were killed in action in 2005. Lance Corporal Timothy Bell, Lance Corporal Eric Bernholtz, Lance Corporal Nicholas Bloom, Lance Corporal Michael Safuentes, Lance Corporal Wesley Davids, Corporal Dustin Durga, PFC Christopher Dixon, Lance Corporal Christopher Dyer, Lance Corporal Nicholas Erdy, Lance Corporal Grant Frazier, Staff Sergeant Anthony Goodwin, Lance Corporal Jonathan Grant, Lance Corporal Jordan Grez, Sergeant Justin Hoffman, Staff Sergeant Kendall Ivey, Sergeant David Kruder, Lance Corporal Aaron Reed, Lance Corporal Christopher Lyons, Lance Corporal Edward Schroeder, Lance Corporal William Whiteman, Corporal Andre Williams, Sergeant David Wimberg, HM3 Travis Youngblood. Get into it, man. <laughs> Whitetail Edge is powered by Gearcast, Illusion Systems, Deer Grow, Redneck Blinds, Spartan Cameras. Analog. So all the formal ceremonies are over. Um, you know, I, I find myself out of the Marine Corps now um, and back home. Um, you know, where I found most peace, I guess, was, uh, you know, that fall getting right back into the tree stand and uh, doing what I loved. Um, you know, it, of all the chaos from that summer, from that deployment, um, it was just, you know, so peaceful to, to be out in nature, um, sitting in a tree stand and just kind of listening to nature, um, getting all your, your thoughts straight and, uh, you know, thinking about everything that you've been through and uh, what you want to do moving forward. So 
So not too long after uh, getting home from the deployment, um, back in the civilian world, just kind of doing my thing. And uh, when you know it, we find out the wife's pregnant and uh, we're having twins. So uh, 2006, you know, we're busy with that. Um, a lot going on, as you can imagine. Um, so it really kept my mind busy uh, off of, you know, the things from the prior year and a lot to look forward to uh, during that year. Um, January 2007 rolls around. Um, wanted to continue serving my community, uh, find myself enrolled in the police academy. And uh, uh, half of that year, you know, I'm, I'm going to the school, going to the police academy. Uh, academy uh, finishes up summer of 2007. Um, applying at a few different agencies and uh, end up applying for the city of Newark, Ohio and uh, you know, get hired by them in 2008. Uh, still currently employed by them to this day. Um, I've done several, uh, several different things within the division uh, during my 15 years there. Um, four and a half years as a detective. Um, Patrol officer for most of that time, and currently a community liaison officer. So you know, I've, I've started a family. Um, you know, hired by the police department, and kind of the years are starting to progress along. Um, you know, really wanted to just kind of take the hunting to a, another level. Um, just, just. You know, I loved it before I went in the Marine Corps um, in high school and stuff, but you know, I really wanted to take it to another level. So, you know, as you can imagine, um, we're starting to get into a you know a time frame where you know technology is starting to come into the hunting world. Um, trail cameras are coming around. You know, um, you know, I'm getting on board with with all this and uh, summer scouting and stuff. Um, really having a lot of success um, shooting some really good deer and so we're, we're moving forward there and uh, just really taking it up a notch so fast forward to 2019 um, I meet Ben through a, a mutual friend and uh, reach out to him about uh, some questions I had and, and maybe coming down and hooking up with me to look over some of my land um, you know, Ben and I kind of hit it off. Um, he finds out I'm a you know law enforcement officer, and uh, you know really finds out that I you know I live close to one of his properties. Uh, we develop a friendship, you know, of course, of that year, and uh, you know Ben asked me to kind of help him out on some of his properties. You know, living close to that area, um, changing out some some batteries and some trail cameras and stuff like that. A couple years go by. Um, I'd sent, I was joking around actually at first, but I'd sent Ben some trail cam pictures of some pretty good deer I had on camera that summer. I said, uh, you know, hey, if I shoot one of these deer on film, you know, you're going to add me to the team. And, uh, you know, I get a phone call a couple minutes later from Ben, you know, saying, well, you know, I'm really not looking to add anybody, but, you know, I like you and I'm going to add you to the team. So it's kind of like a, I hung up the phone and really wasn't really sure what to think. Um, Following a uh, year goes by, um, I get a phone call um, to come to the meeting uh, summer of 2022, and uh, that's where I met, you know, Dylan, um, other team members at the meeting, and, and really kind of get involved at that point. So summer's grinding along, um, doing what you know a lot of guys are doing. I'm running mineral sites, um, trail cameras. Just uh, really taking inventory of the deer and uh, you know, putting in the homework, you know, late summer, hanging, hanging the Novix tree stands, um, doing everything I can to make this year a success. So I locate uh, the deer that I want to go after this year and, uh, you know, he's just really, really stood out to me, um, you know, from the time I saw him in velvet, you know, all, all the way up through. You know when they, when they shed the, the velvet 
Um, really great mass. I just really locked on with this deer and knew that he was the one I wanted to go after. September 10th, and uh, we're out here on a spot we got double crop beans in. And they're coming in pretty nice now, so hopefully stay green for a while. And uh, give us a little longer on these beans to hunt over. So um, coming down this field edge here. And uh, got our first scrape along this field edge here. And this is the spot we're hunting deer called deer. Um, so, he's been showing up quite a bit in this bean field. Um, just came back here, changed out the batteries in the camera, Spartan camera, and, uh, not gonna spend too much time here. We're gonna get out of here. Midday, I like to come in here midday. It's about the only time I'll come back here. Uh, I know he's bedded just to the west of us here. So, all right, we're gonna get out of here. So this property, you know, is, is mostly agriculture, um, but up to a 40 acre bedding area, and then it, it opens up into ag fields all around it. Um, what really stood out to me this year, you know, was the crop rotation. Um, I knew the prior fall, you know, when the farmer put the winter wheat in this field, that it was gonna be, you know, eventually be soybeans. So, uh, you know, July of 22, you know, he picks the wheat and puts the, the double crop soybeans in the ground. And I knew it was going to be magic at that point. Um, you know, uh, everything around me, you know, was getting picked. Um, crops were turning brown. And, you know, I still have a green, nice green uh, soybean field that these deer are just coming out and, and hammering on. So we're getting close to the season uh, starting here in Ohio. And, you know, I, I just kind of was watching the weather, uh, watching deer cast, and, and tried to put a game plan together. Um, one thing that really kind of stood out to me that week was, you know, we're coming off some hot days, uh, 80 degrees, and then the, the couple days leading up to the season opener, you know, we were dropping into the 60s. Um, I thought that was going to be a good, uh, good front to get these deer up and moving and uh, during daylight hours. So... Uh, Season opener rolls around um, last week there in September here in Ohio and you know wouldn't you know it um, I find uh, everything's going to line up I got good wind everything I need to get into this stand location so I'm going to make it you know give it a shot make try to make it happen. It's finally here September 24th 22 opening day of archery season here in Ohio. And uh, we are heading out, first sit of the year. Nice, uh, beautiful weather, nice cold front. Came in, uh, I think Thursday. I think we woke up to uh, Thursday morning uh, in the 60s and it's been pretty much in the 60s uh, since and it looks like it's gonna be in the 60s, the uh, highest 60 maybe this coming week, so. Uh, like I said, we're heading out and uh, got a real nice uh, heavy 6x7 that we are after this year and uh, we'll see if we can make it happen hunting over a double crop bean field. So this field was planted in uh, July after the winter wheat came off. So uh, beans are still nice and green and a lot of deer hit this field hard. So. A lot of the other fields turning yellow and, and brown and everything so it's kind of that transition time but uh, this field's still nice and green and um, see what happens here white tail edge is brought to you by these other fine sponsors advantage ag and equipment hha sports miller's gun and supply rogue bow strings nfp insurance Classic Rack, Cobra Archery, Packer Max, and E-Bikes of Holmes County.
buck I call kickstand. You know, he's out in the field, just a you know a really giant four-year-old. Um, you know, just looked really good. I got some really good footage of him um, out with some other deer that evening. Um, you know, the buck I'm after, you know, deer, he doesn't show up that evening. So, you know, I was able to get out of the stand, get out of there completely undetected, and, you know, felt really confident about the next day. Well, uh, day two here in Ohio, and uh, had a pretty good set last night. Um, several bucks, uh, six, probably six bucks, different bucks last night. Um, passed a really, really nice uh, four-year-old. Uh, I believe he's a four-year-old. He's a six by five and uh, probably low 60s so obviously hoping he makes it to uh, next year and uh, gonna be a complete hammer next year but um, so yeah I had that bucket probably 30 yards in the beans last night and uh, tough pass but you gotta let these things grow up try to get maximum age out of them um, so probably gonna go back in tonight uh, we got a a little bit of a northwest wind. Uh, I would prefer to be completely west or southwest, but um, I think we'll be all right. Probably going to go back in tonight and uh, give it a try for the buck we're after. So, all right. Well, stay tuned, guys. Get into the stand that evening. You know, deer cast is showing okay, but I uh, still felt really good about everything. Um, like I said, I have, you know, really good green food source. Um, I've got water nearby. I've got, you know, everything, good wind. Everything's just lining up for this, this evening. Um, so we get into the, you know, the kind of the golden hour, if you will. Um, deer starting to, you know, come out, out, you know, far off. I see deer moving around the bean field. Um, just everything's, you know, really looking good. Um, I'm feeling really good. Uh, we get down to, you know, inside that last hour, you know how anything can happen. Um, a couple minutes later, um, I find, uh, I see through the, through the brush coming out of the, the thicket, the bedding area, is the deer I'm after. And uh, so I get everything, you know, trying to get my cameras on, get everything fired up and ready to make this happen. Um, go back, look at some footage, and uh, wouldn't you know it, my my card had filled up and uh, actually shut the camera off literally right before I made the shot. Um, fortunately for me, you know, I had a GoPro running behind me that was able to pick up, you know, part of the hunt there and, and part of the shot. So really thankful for that. We just got down here and uh, this buck literally went 35 yards and uh, right in the bean field here he went down. Well, like I said, I don't think that 
shot was on camera because I think right before I shot my camera shut off I don't know what the heck happened but I'll have to review footage and see what's going on but uh big buck down baby white toe edge You know, walking up on this deer, I obviously knew where he was, uh, he went down, um, saw him go down from the stand. And, uh, you know, I was completely just in awe at this, the mass on this deer. Um, you know, he, he was everything I thought he would be. Um, just a ton of points, you know, 15 points. Um, the mass was just insane, carried all the way out his main beams. Um, I was just completely thrilled, you know, to get this deer on the ground and, uh, you know, the boys there, um, able to catch, you know, Dylan there with me, catch this uh, on film and uh, really make some memories of a lifetime for me. The first key to this hunt was definitely the crop rotation, you know. Uh, like I said, you know, going back even the prior uh, fall, um, when those, you know, when that winter wheat was planted, I knew that, you know, this field was going to be golden the following season, and uh, I was going to have a green food source, you know, well into the, the fall. Another factor that made this hunt successful was my entry and exit into the stand location. Um, basically, you know, from where I parked. To, to the stand, I had a you know a drainage ditch that was grown up. I was able to get you know up this uh, along this drainage ditch um, between the the corn and the ditch, and completely undetected, I was able to get to the stand. And uh, you know, as you can see, it just totally worked out for me. Final factor that made this hunt you know successful was um, having a water source uh, there for these deer to. To hit um, coming out of their their bedding areas and uh, going out into the, the food source, um, you know this this water source. Um, I put this in uh, the prior season and uh, knew I needed something to kind of draw these deer a little closer to me, um, especially early season. Um, so this was definitely a you know a key in, in success for this deer. Um, you know, I knew you know, trail cameras were showing me that he was hitting this water hole on a regular basis and uh, I just needed to be there when he did to make it happen. So obviously I'm tagged out, um, second day of Ohio, you know, bow season and uh, kind of have a long uh, season yet ahead of me. Um, you know, being an avid bow hunter, you know, I'm, I'm not done at that point. You know, I'm still putting in the work, um, running cameras, you know, you name it, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, it's, we're starting to get to that point. Mock scrapes are, you know, definitely getting busy with the deer. Um, I'm, I'm doing all this, you know, put a rub, you know, rub post in, um, getting that, you know, scent on that with the, the Black Widow scents. And, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, um, you know, my son, he's got a tag. Um, I know he's busy, you know, he's, he's young, he's 12 years old, he's, he's involved with a lot of sports and activities. But uh, at some point through the season, I know he's going to get a chance to, to make it out and do some hunting. Ohio gun season gets here, all the stars are kind of aligning, you know, deer cast says, 
it's good. Uh, we have good wind. Uh, cold temperatures, it's very cold out. Uh, we get in there. I knew this deer was, these deer, you know, especially the deer he's after is going to be coming to food. Um, I think it was uh, 31, 30 degrees out that day and for a high. So I knew, you know, it was just a matter of time. Um, Cooper, you know, he gets settled in his stand as every young kid, you know, he's spending the first couple hours there, you know, playing on his phone, kind of just trying to pass the time. Uh, we get, you know, into that golden hour, 45 minutes there, and, uh, you know, I say, hey, time to put the phone down and start focusing. So we're, you know, in the blind, um, deer just pouring out everywhere. Um, wouldn't you know it? About a hundred yards away, out steps pitchfork. You see him? Yeah. Ready? Are you on him? Yeah. Good. And I say, when you're ready to go, make the shot. And sure enough, he makes the shot. Um, we could tell in the footage, you know, he put a great shot on this deer and you know, the deer went out of the food plot and into the timber. I killed this deer December 18th, 2022, last day of Ohio gun season. And I actually have a few years of history with this deer, as you can see by the sheds. And a few years ago, I shot him, but it was a low shot, so, but he stuck around. A few, a few weeks ago, I could have shot, I had a shot of him, but I couldn't shoot before, before he, I didn't have a shot, and, but December 18th, he gave me a shot, I took it, I hit him, he ran about 30 yards, I shot him with the 350 legend, yeah, what's the ledge? You know, again, I just want to thank uh, Ben and Whitetail Edge, and, uh, you know, for the opportunity to to be where I'm at, um, you know, definitely a lot of hard work over the years. Um, nothing was just you know handed to me or, or given to me. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of headaches, a lot of you know stress. Um, you name it, uh, we've all kind of been there. But uh, really, just thankful for the opportunity, and uh, especially you know Dylan um, wanting to kind of show tribute to you know my fallen brothers um, that I served with overseas and uh, keeping their legacy and tradition going. Thank you. If you like Whitetail Edge, please subscribe uh, to our channels. And uh, you know, we're on a lot of different platforms, but go to our socials, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, watch us on Masio Go, Carbon TV, uh, Rumble, you name it, we're out there. Again, thanks for watching Whitetail Edge and have a great day.